Uh, Hillary has been lengthening her excuses as to why uh, she lost the election. She didn't really lose the election. It was stolen from her uh, by, I think it's up to 24 different excuses she has now. Number 24 is content farms in Macedonia. And uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather was a uh, Macedonian content farmer. And uh, we often think about, you know, gathering on the porch and recalling the old days on the Macedonian. I never thought, he never thought that the old content farmers he left behind in Macedonia would one day steal the U.S. presidential election. They are gnarled, hard-working Macedonian peasants, and the way they were able to reach The European Parliament Macedonia. votes on Tuesday in a secret ballot for the next EU Commission president, with German Defense Minister von der Leyen the quote-unquote agreed-upon nominee. But complications abound, and if she does not get the required votes, or if the vote is postponed, or if British MEPs put her over the top, the EU's already tattered reputation could take another hit, complicating further Zoran Zayev's pleading with the EU for a date to start membership talks for Macedonia. Meanwhile, President Macron of France, a shrewd player in the EU politics game and one rumored to be not very fond of giving a date to Macedonia to start EU accession talks, is biding his time and counting his cards, so to speak, as a wounded Angela Merkel continues shaking, literally, raising questions about her health and how long she will remain in the position of German Chancellor. In Macedonia, fallout from Zayev's gullibility and falling for a couple of pranksters over a long period of time continues, with his diminished standing in Macedonia and abroad. But Macedonians and international leaders are simply embarrassed by his antics, and there are growing calls for him to step down and call early elections. We'll discuss all of this on more in this episode of the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. I'm Jason Miko, coming to you from the foot of the Catalina Mountains in Oro Valley, Arizona. And this is Svetin Shalimanov. I'm calling in from the Casablanca of the Balkans, Skopje, Macedonia. Casablanca <laughs> is not, uh, not it's a city which has Mediterranean access, which we obviously don't, but it's a city which is so full of spies right now that that's the main uh, <laughs> industrial branch at this point in Skopje. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, although, of course, as we know, as we discussed in our tourism podcast, uh, a few weeks ago, as as you get further south, it feels more Mediterranean there, and you know this is summer, so uh, we want to encourage people not only to experience the many spies running around Macedonia, but also <laughs> the more Mediterranean climate down to the south. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Svetin, we just—I know—we just recorded a podcast last week, uh, not even a week ago, and today we're recording this on July 14, Sunday, Bastille Day, uh, mm -hmm. for all of our friends in France. Uh, it'll probably drop tomorrow, July 15. And I celebrate May 25 as the first time, May 25, 1996, the first time I ever set foot in Macedonia. So that's kind of my mm -hmm. anniversary date. But it was July 15, 1996, 23 years ago, that I arrived in Macedonia with two pieces of luggage <laughs> for what I thought would be a three-month uh, gig with uh, the uh, humanitarian group Mercy Corps, working, living in Macedonia, but working both in Macedonia and Kosovo. So... 23 years ago, uh, I first, well, the second time actually I arrived, but I arrived with an intention to stay for three months. And here we are 23 <laughs> years later, Svetin, uh, after, of course, I lived in Macedonia for seven years from 96 to 2003 and then spent most of the aughts there. But here we are 23 years later and, uh, you know, we're doing a podcast. I got the weekly column, I've done all these things regarding Macedonia. So uh, all to say... Uh, it's, it's kind of amazing in life, and this is kind of a 30,000-foot, 10,000-meter perspective. It's kind of amazing when you, you think you know what you're going to do, and all of a sudden, <laughs> something else happens. And, uh, you know, at least for me, I'm, I'm so glad that I am, have got to spend, have, have spent all this time in Macedonia. I think that's, that's where God wants me to be and put me. And I, I know that my enemies don't feel the same way, but too bad for them. Yeah, well, I have many more friends here than, than enemies uh considering your contribution and all, all the work you're, you've been doing around. But yeah, I, I can imagine that both of us have stepped on a few toes uh, here, and, here and there. Absolutely. So uh, anyway. Oh, it, means, um, it means we're doing something right, I guess. I think so, yeah. So, uh, mm. And of course, if you don't have any enemies, then you're probably doing something wrong. So yeah. uh, that's always the case. Well, uh, but anyway, moving on, let's uh, talk about news from Macedonia. Um, I think the continuing fallout from Zayev's uh, gullibility and, and, uh, with the, uh, the pranksters continues. 
Uh, I see stuff in the news, on social media, etc. Um, what do you hear from uh, what's going on in Macedonia with regard to uh, the fallout from that? Well, uh, I actually spoke to one of those guys, the, the, the one who was pretending to be Poroshenko. Oh. I, did a, I did an interview with him <laughs> for Very a new cool. site. I, yeah, I work with uh, occasional here. And um, uh, with Lexus, I spoke with Lexus, uh, Alexei Stolyarov. And uh, uh-huh. I mean, um, my only question was, why did you break it off? Because at one point, Zaev was the one who was calling them and texting them. Oh, e- everybody wow. else saw through the through the ploy in like 10 minutes and Zayev took uh, uh, about a year to he, he, he would never have realized that he's being pranked he would still think that he's uh, communicating with the actual Poroshenko and I tell them why do you break it off we're on the verge of joining NATO you can have uh, the, <laughs> I, imagine the stuff he would be able to give you <laughs> he, he can whatsapp uh, use uh, you know they use this uh, whatsapp application he can yeah. whatsapp uh, uh, NATO weapon specs to you directly, <laughs> but they said, "Okay, we were bored. We're not an intelligence agency. Obviously, they they want to dispel this." No, they're comedians. They're doing it for for fun. So yeah, I mean, uh. maybe, maybe not. Who cares? It's it's a, it was great fun uh, in uh, uh, either case. Uh, and uh, one of the things Zayev himself revealed was that uh, he sent them a picture of. Uh, uh, an Israeli Austrian businessman who works with social democratic parties across uh, Europe, helping them organize their propaganda uh, mm-hmm. campaigns, uh, Tal, uh, Tal Silberstein. And uh, the person became notorious in Austria in uh, 2017 because he was setting up fake news uh, websites and Facebook groups in which uh, he would, uh, he would, uh, Silberstein would work with the Austrian social democrats. Uh, to bring down their then coalition partner, the conservative party OVP, led by Sebastian Kurz, by accusing uh, OVP of being uh, racist. So he would set up like fake statements from uh, OVP people, from Kurz's people, in which they would uh, be over the top nationalist, uh, you know, almost Austrian fascist, uh, etc. And uh, he, he was paid like 400,000 euros by the Social Democrats for all of this. And uh, the news broke before their 2017 elections in Austria. Mm-hmm. And it actually, uh, Silberstein's uh, antics actually damaged uh, his employer a lot. Uh, they actually helped bring down, uh, uh, significantly weaken the Social Democratic Party, which allowed Kurds to form a coalition with uh, the more nationalist FPO party. Mm-hmm. And then two years later, this uh, Ibiza scandal appears again in front of elections, in front of the European elections, and it brings down the um, FPO. It reveals that the FPO leader, the nationalist leader in Austria, in coalition with Kurds, is uh, discussing with a Russian uh, uh, woman who presents herself as, I don't know, working for some businessman, yada, yada, yada. Uh, And um, they're talking business and uh, corrupt business, I guess. (laughs) So this helped bring down the Kurds government. Uh, and uh, Kurz actually went public and said that the people like Tal Silberstein were involved in bringing down his government. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the funny thing is, uh, Zayev is meeting Silberstein in Skopje. Obviously, they're doing something. They're setting up. He's obviously helping Zayev on Zayev's propaganda machine, which is just as despicable and fake news uh, oriented, etc. And then he's. Uh, and I suppose this Silberstein guy by now has this reputation of bringing down a party which was seen in Europe as pro-Russian, even though he, maybe he was faking the whole Russian angle with fake Russians, but okay, who cares? Uh, and and Zaev is so stupid, he's actually tweeting pictures of himself and Silberstein to, to actual Russian pranksters. <laughs> wow. So, you know, he's telling Russian pranksters who are secretly recording Zaev his his call uh, their calls with Zaev that he's meeting with uh, this uh, Israeli guy who who is uh, notorious for similar fake news uh, manipulative propaganda campaigns he's doing but his are oriented against Russia and Zaev is actually informing Russians <laughs> about the <laughs> movements he's telling them Silverstein is flying from Skopje to Kiev tomorrow to meet you my friend Poroshenko. And the Russian guy says, oh, yes, I know, Silberstein is a great guy. <laughs> Excellent that you're working with him. <laughs> oh, my so, God, let me ask you this. what a you, moron. Do we, know, 
Yes. Do we know if there's are there going to be any more um, um, any more recordings or texts or tweets or SMS messages coming out from from the pranksters that uh, recorded Zayev? No, this should be it. They told me this this is it. Yeah. All right. Well, it's it's enough, and it it's the gift that keeps on giving. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that we'll continue to. Uh, uh, enjoy uh, that for some time to come although again you know as as many in macedonia have called uh for zayev to resign because he's an embarrassment and again you know it goes back i think to his his uh, what he has a fleet of 4584 advisors or something like Mm. that and every single one of them should be uh fired for allowing this to happen i mean yeah, Zayev's an idiot. We know that, but um, you would assume that that these these advisors that he have they has are, are a little bit smarter than him, but apparently they're not. Yeah, it's uh, he's uh, surrounding himself with people like the Silberstein. Uh, he's got obviously a similar profile person in Eric Burns, the American uh, Media Matters for America. Uh, oh right, advisor who is detached to, with his government. Uh, there is another person who apparently works with. Uh, Silberstein, who is uh, on the record as being uh, Zayev's advisor. So uh, Zayev came out after the recordings and he accused the, the Russian pranksters of uh, producing fake news about him, which is not true. I mean, this is not fake news. This is him being a, an idiot. Uh, but uh, he wants to use the, uh, the incident uh, to justify additional... Uh, you know, they're all, uh, Zav's government is already going after people f- for simple Facebook comments, uh, accusing them, uh, accusing everybody on the right of uh, spreading hate speech, and they're sending police to people's uh, homes in the afternoon and the evening to scare them from against criticizing uh, Zav. Uh, wow. Now he would like he would like to use this regulation he's announcing, anti-fake news regulation, to uh, shut down news outlets, who he, which he doesn't like. Uh, well, at the same time, he's employing uh, a fake news propagandist from Austria who has criminal charges in Romania, in Israel, for this type of uh, sleaze and corruption and uh, setting up fake Facebook uh, uh, groups. I mean, this podcast is jokingly called the Macedonian content farmers, but Zaev is working with an Austrian-Israeli content farmer. Um, and then, obviously, the other thing which uh, stuck uh, from the scandal is how scared Zaev is of the Kosovo-Serbia proposed border change, uh, which he obviously realizes will uh, uh, mean the end of Macedonia. I mean, once we begin re- redrawing borders in Macedonia, and if, especially if at that point Macedonia is not led by a, a government which represents ethnic Macedonians here, that would be the end of the country easily. I mean, in a, mm. that would snap Macedonia as a twig. And he's accusing Vucic of being a Russian agent. Okay, fine. I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, he, he, literally every second word Zaev uses in these tapes is Russia, Russia, uh, Russia is the problem. Russia is uh, the the root of all, all evil. In the mm. case of Vucic, obviously Vucic is playing this card. He wants to be like. On the one hand, they work with the West, on the other with Russia. Sure. But then he's accusing Hashim Tachi in Kosovo of doing the same. So he's actually accusing a pro-Erdoganist president of Kosovo of also being a pro-Russian and anti-Western person, which can cause all sorts of trouble in Kosovo domestically and from Kosovo toward Macedonia. So uh, quite not, not the sharpest tool in the shed. Definitely not. Uh, And interesting, I want to go back to what you just said about um, uh, the so-called quote-unquote hate speech. Again, there is no such thing as hate speech. Uh, But he's uh, maybe he's not arresting people for so-called hate speech, but sending the police to intimidate and threaten folks who say things that he doesn't like. So for all of our friends that are in NATO, uh, NATO member countries, etc., this is a this is a country, Macedonia, and a government, the government of Zoran Zayev, that is about to become a member of NATO that threatens uh, to arrest and intimidates citizens for exercising their free right to speech. Uh, mm. Well done. Good one there. Um, let's, I want to I talk about this, um, the Boki 13 scandal. I don't think we talked about it last week. <laughs> I saw it in passing, uh, Svetin, but before we do, I just got to pour myself uh, another Mastica here. So just a moment. <laughs> Yeah, I'm on antibiotics, unfortunately, right now. So, so it's you're, you're going to be drinking solo this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. Uh, 
nice glass of Mastica here. Uh, so the Bokeh 13 scandal, you, f fill us in and fill me in because I haven't really followed it. Yeah, we didn't have enough time the last time. I just ticked off a few scandals and uh, we had so much going on after the long, the, the what what was it, a week and a half he at us. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably the you know most bizarre corruption scandal we've ever had. We've had some doozies and this is yeah. a repeat of a corruption scandal like the ones like the one which we had in A1. Uh, the concept of the scandal is you have a powerful TV station mm -hmm. uh, which has journalists which have cooperated with the secret police, cooperate with the secret police, come from the left, uh, with, obviously with their background and baggage in uh, this area. They have uh, uh, they're essentially approaching business people, politicians, and telling them, "Listen, I have information uh, from my sources. You know." who my sources are, you, you, you understand that much. Mm -hmm. I have a powerful media outlet, I'm going to bury, I'm going to publish damaging information against you, so you better pay up. Uh, the A1 what? scandal included not paying taxes, not paying the rent, not paying the employees, blah, 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 and it ended badly for their owner. But as soon as uh, Zayev took over the government, so, so A1 collapsed in 2010, 2011, uh, with a you know, widely publicized raid, and then this mm -hmm. made Philip Pricker get all angry at Vimera. I suppose that much of the what, what, what has been happening since then by uh, the U.S. diplomacy against Vimera comes from the fact that Phil Ricker was angry because he had a bunch of friends in A1, and they were, um, you know, they nobody lost their jobs. They they just moved on to different. Uh, to being funded by USAID or Soros or whoever, but he was angry that A1 was closed. Now, as soon as Zayev formed the, the government, uh, Boki 13 shows up and he sets up a TV station named, obviously, after A1. It's called One TV. Boki 13, Boyan Jovanovsky is his name. He's this uh, flamboyantly uh, cross-dressing personality who is, uh, uh, you know, it's, I don't know... Uh, Serbian uh, kitschiest uh, reality TV programs, he would be there to be like this uh, object of mockery. So imagine if you're in a room of this type of people who would uh, participate in a Serbian kitschy reality <laughs> TV show. And, 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 and if you are the butt of the joke, you can imagine how low you are on the, on the totem pole. Um, and then all of a sudden he's got uh, odes of money, he's uh, setting up this uh, lavishly funded TV station. He's paying Sasha Ordanovsky. He's paying Bolyan Yovanovsky. What's, and what's the name of the TV station? Uh, One TV. The name One is obviously okay. uh, ripped from A1. Sure. Uh, and so he sets up uh, the TV station, modeled after A1, many of the same personalities there. And then one businessman appears, another businessman appears. They say he's racketeering us. He wants, he, he threatens that he's going to publish something against me on his TV station if I don't give him, in the case of one uh, residential developer, a, an entire apartment for him in my uh, new building. And then eventually Girovsky, a journalist who is very close to SDSM, sure. but has now obviously, who, who defended Veli Aramkovsky A1 in the original similar scandal. Uh, apparently he's not part of this organization now. He apparently feels bad that he's left out of it. So he goes with public revelations accusing Boki 13, Alexander Kiratsovsky, the recently deposed ASDSM party secretary general, mm -hmm. and a bunch of uh, lesser personalities like Frosina Reminsky, Lila Filipovska. Uh, Gerovsky is careful to use all these nicknames for them. So Boki is called Koki, Kiratsovsky is called Kiki in his writing, Frosina Reminsky is called Friki. Some of them acknowledge that they are the ones who are being written about. So uh, others obviously still haven't uh, come up, uh, but uh, Gerovsky is careful not to be sued over this, but it, the, the names he's using are so the easy to... Yeah. yeah. Uh, everybody with a half a brain can uh, uh, tell them. And uh, the way they would do this is uh, they would approach a businessman and tell him, you know, in one case he, he details, they asked for a huge bribe which this person claimed he doesn't have as revenue, not as profits, just as revenue annually. And they asked this as a bribe. And the person allegedly fainted and almost died.
from heart attack when he heard the price in the presence of powerful SDSM officials around Boki 13 demanding the money. In the other story, he tells uh, they got a piece of land in, uh, I suppose, Ohrid uh, from the municipality for free, and then they ostensibly to build up like a shelter for uh, like an orphanage or whatever. Uh, and uh, Boki is big on this fake uh, humanitarian project. And then they sold it for commercial development. Hmm. So this is what Gerovsky details. But also, eventually, in the worst case, uh, they approached a former mayor in Skopje. Um, there are two possibilities. I mean, it's pretty clear. It's one of them, but uh, okay, let's not uh, use the name. A person who has been attacked badly by, by SDSM after SDSM took over the government, and they uh, extorted money from him, again, hundreds of thousands of euros, from his business, uh, using wiretaps. Hmm. Now, Boki has hired uh, the son of Kati Tsayanova, the special prosecutor, wow. in his television. Uh, Sasha Ordanovsky, who works for Boki, is the most outspoken supporter of Kati Tsayanova. So now we have uh, a corrupt uh, TV station, uh, corrupt owner, corrupt party officials, using wiretaps from Zayev's cash of wiretaps, to blackmail p people around Macedonia, extorting money from them. And this is all reported not by somebody on the right, but by a prominent leftist journalist who was breaking bread, bread with all these people literally until yesterday. Hmm. So it's quite... Uh, so the cross-dressing aside. It's yeah, the cross-dressing, yes. The freakishness uh, of Boki 13 aside, the corruption, the nepotism, etc., Interesting because you know again here we are we we started I started the monologue talking about uh, the European Union um, Commission jockeying and and whatnot and you know whether or not Macedonia is going to get a date for a session talks this fall or not uh, and part of that of course is, hinges on you know the idea that that Macedonia is quote unquote ready to start those accession mm. talks but what you're just describing Svetin with all of this mm. corruption that's going on and it's just it's out in the open frankly. Uh, countries like France and the Netherlands and, and some of these others that are a little bit skeptical of in giving Macedonia, not to say, to say nothing of Albania, a date mm. to start a session talks, are going to look at this ongoing uh, corruption and say, well, maybe not. doesn't matter what Zayev did with Greece and, the, and, and forcibly changing the name, etc. I just can't see how Macedonia is ready to start a session talks. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is really, really ugly. I mean, uh, uh, the, no other country in Europe has this percentage of opposition members of parliament in prison, under investigation, forced right. to vote this way or the other, to be released from prison, former officials in prison, number of media outlets shut down in the brief two years since I was government, uh, and then this sleaze and corruption which Zayev had before taking over the government, which is now coming up uh, magnified, uh, multiplied. I mean, obviously my opinion of the EU is exceptionally low. And <laughs> Mine too. I think <laughs> we are operating on the assumption that it's actually, it would be actually hilarious if we did join and made as much mess of the union as possible and... Uh, uh, shock everybody inside with all these types of corruption, but then for, uh, reinforced even further once we have access to their funding, to the, to the money they're giving, actually. Imagine once Zayev taps, taps into the actual sources of uh, EU funding, that's going to be exactly. <laughs> a completely yeah. new, new ball yeah. game. Yeah, cause th then all, all, all that has gone on before would just be chump change compared to the, the money that the yeah. EU would then <laughs> give the government of Zoran Zayev that would then uh, misappropriate and abuse it. Yeah, he will be taking European farm subsidies for cannabis cultivation and then, uh, you know, selling it illegally through, through Europe. <laughs> it's going to be... <laughs> wow, well, again, yeah, that's... Um, so, okay. but then we have to begin accession talks, uh, and this obviously depends on Angela Merkel being in working right. order by, uh, until October, which is <laughs> when we expect that uh, the council will discuss this thing again. Maybe they weekend and, at Bernie's her and... Uh, She's, <laughs> uh, we get the accession talks this way. But then there is this interesting development to mention that they'll be voting on Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen 
uh, in the European Parliament uh, soon, and uh, she's actually being pressured. One of the uh, main demands, uh, so that she gets the votes she needs to be elected uh, Commission President, from the socialist part of the Parliament, uh, from the Social Democrats, is that uh, she agrees publicly, openly, that Macedonia and Albania should begin accession talks, because both countries are now among the very few countries in Europe run by socialist, social democratic parties. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, van der Leyen is dependent on the, the social democratic vote, and they want uh, to deliver for Zaev and Rama, the social mm -hmm. democrats in the European Parliament, and they demand her commitment on this issue. Uh, so basically, they want us to open accession talks, but also, also the Visegrads want us to open accession talks because like, people like Orban and Salvini, they all signed up on this, uh, uh, you know, the Poles, etc. And the Brits, mm -hmm. uh, ironically, hilariously. And this is all because uh, they recognize that once we join, we will, be, uh, we will quickly re revert to our Visegrad style, uh, right wing, uh, you know, the Gravsky style of doing politics, which they like and uh, which maybe served as a blueprint for, for some of these guys, for at least some of these guys, if not all of them. <laughs> and uh, so now the Social Democrats want us in, uh, the right-wingers want us in, but these centrist conservatives uh, and especially the liberal Democrats in uh, uh, the Netherlands and France, they're having second thoughts because they realize what happens you know, with, uh, when even more countries like ours join the European Union, when Serbia, Montenegro join, all the mess they'll be exposed to. So uh, it's a very, very comical situation in Brussels at this point. Well, ex exactly. And, and even if even if von der Leyen gets in on uh, on Tuesday and things proceed as they've agreed in their in their smoke filled um, back rooms, uh, even if all that happens and she says yes we'll uh, we'll start a session talks with Macedonia and Albania in the fall that doesn't mean anything um there's a lot that could happen between now and then and so we'll we'll just kind of have to watch that and see uh as we as we just talked about there there's a lot of baggage that Macedonia would bring with it and Albania would bring with it as well if they were to start a session talks there's a lot of um countries in in Europe that that don't want to have that while the EU is in such a mess as it is no, it's, uh, we, we, I mean, at this point, I'm uh, obviously option one for us was always that we drop the name talks, we stay Republic of Macedonia, and we never join the EU, maybe join NATO as some kind of like an accession, like a, I don't know, non voting member uh, or something, but we just trade with the EU and that's it. But right. now I'm beginning to warm to this idea that we actually join the EU and, and mess them up re real bad. Oh yeah, I mean that's and that's frankly there were some members of the U EU that really wanted the UK to exit to Brexit because because of of people like yeah. Boris Johnson and others who said that once in the EU they would you know kind of mess it up and so they the EU members didn't want them in there to mess it up and 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 yeah I think that's a real possibility uh, of of country the Visegrad countries uh, etc that you mentioned once and once Macedonia is in the EU, if it ever gets in the EU, then then uh, essentially serving the uh, the role of quote unquote wreckers. Yeah, yeah. This uh, former French ambassador to uh, Washington, uh, Gérard Ayro, or if I'm pronouncing this correctly, <laughs> pardon my French. Uh, he actually <laughs> said this said, said this much. So he's basically one of the premier diplomats of France. Uh, the ambassador to Washington recently resigned with his boyfriend. Uh, to spend his uh, retirement uh, on the Côte d'Azur, I suppose. And mm -hmm. uh, he actually, he was tweeting at a British guy uh, very openly on Twitter, telling them, why do we need countries like Macedonia, Albania to join? This is your British plot. You're, you want to bring these countries <laughs> into, into the EU to wreck our lovely union. You're, you want to bring more and more of these uh, bleep hole countries into the union. And uh, it's great. I mean, <laughs> the Brits are leaving. But they're pushing us in. They're setting things up so that, uh, as I would say, the Netherlands or France, they would be embarrassed not to let us join after all these concessions we've made. And once we're in, you know, we revert to, uh, you know, or, or 
desire for whoever is in charge or uh, Vimmer if uh, Vimmer take over. Uh, I mean, the best the EU could hope for would be for a, a Vimmer government to take over because Vimmer had some standards and some morals and some principles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm actually even thinking that it would be actually fa- funnier to have Zayev run Macedonia in, in the EU for a few years <laughs> just to give them a, a taste of their own medicine. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think this speaks to the, you know, the, the hardcore EU folks who want to continue to usurp power from the individual sovereign nation states that make up the EU because that's what they don't what they don't want is is sovereign parliaments of EU member states making decisions mm. because that then tends to what we're just talking about they then have the right to uh, interfere and, and wreck and whatever the beautiful EU project quote unquote and so that is why the hardcore EU types really want to the ever closer union and more Europe etc that they all talk about so that if the individual sovereign nation states that make up the European Union have no power whatsoever and it's all controlled and centralized in Brussels then mm. there's nothing that these folks can do they can't wreck or disrupt or do anything else and that's ultimately the goal of these these hardcore um, uh, EU types that want to create the United States of Europe uh, but I just don't see it happening long term or short term. Yeah, yeah. I, I see the whole thing actually falling apart relatively soon and when I say soon I mean within the next decade yeah the more they pressure the sooner it will uh, fall apart but uh, uh, I mean, we're not going to reform it. Uh, the, the individual countries or or the EU, we're all too far gone here. So you know, I'm 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 honestly rooting for the the worst, the, the most disruption <laughs> <laughs> possible. Well, you know, and this is something that speaks to um, the whole uh, conservative philosophy, and that's small C conservative, you know, classical liberal uh, things that you and I. Svetin talk about a lot and agree upon, uh, and that is there's a certain amount of, I don't know what the right word here is, of, I guess, a slight amount of pessimism or sadness uh, concerning the whole project of humanity and whatnot, I, and I think that's actually good in a way, because we're, we're not the utopians like our friends on the progressive left who believe in the perfectibility yeah. of mankind and are going full bore, full steam ahead running roughshod over everybody else without regard to what anybody else thinks and, and demanding that we all march to their beat. And so it, it mm. kind of serves that, that, that slight pessimism, I guess, the, the sadness almost serves as a break on that utopianist project. Uh, and that's something I've always thought about that, that true conservatives feel, and, I, and it's good in a way, I think. Yeah, well, it's happened a bunch of times before, and it's bound to happen again. Uh, and, you know, best, best case scenario is Europe falls, and then uh, it serves as example for the United States, pour encouragement les autres, uh, in this case, just as, uh, you know, uh, just as this horrible example of uh, things going so badly, so that uh, maybe it wakes, uh, wakes the still salvageable parts of the world <laughs> maybe, <laughs> from yeah, their stupor. It, it, Exactly, but again, it, it speaks. It speaks to this. This as conservatives, we believe in the. Uh, we believe that mankind is fallen, and broken. That we are part of the crooked timber of humanity, as Kant said. That you cannot make mankind perfect, and then it takes force and totalitarianism in order to make mankind quote unquote perfect, which can't be done. But to to force him into that mold, and this is again, this is something that Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who I think is the greatest writer of the twentieth century. A Russian, I might add, who mm. warned the West in the 1970s when he came, when he was thrown out of the Soviet Union and came to the United States, and warned the West, and not about the dangers of the Soviet Union. We already knew that. He warned yeah. us about becoming like the Soviet Union, and that was 50 years ago. And yet we didn't listen then, and we didn't listen now. And there's something in his book, Warning to the West, from 1973, that he said. And, and I'm paraphrasing here, you can almost see Solzhenitsyn shrugging his shoulders and sighing and saying, well, I guess mankind, <laughs> everybody must learn from experience. And, yep, yep. and that's what's going to happen with the European Union and, frankly, with NATO. We'll all yeah, learn the only from school our of humanity. Sorry? The only, school of hum- the only school of humanity. Exactly. I'll, so I'll Learn no place else. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what else, uh, what else we got going on that we can talk about here? Uh, we have... Uh, actually, I said there were no new uh, major scandals breaking. We were just 
developing the old ones from last week. But actually, there was one. Uh, I just remembered uh, this uh, Chicago-based Albanian kid who is publishing uh, wiretaps from uh, Zaev's cache. Mm -hmm. He's uh, aiming them at Dewey, but then he also published one, uh, the entirety of one of the most notorious tapes from 2015, which Zaev used to spark protests against Nikola Gruevsky, against Vemera. Uh, and this is the tape uh, where uh, Gruevsky is discussing uh, uh, the murder of uh, Martin Nishkovsky, the kid who was killed uh, in 2011 during the uh, Vemera celebration victory after winning the early general elections that year. And the kid was actually just got, uh, uh, he was beaten up brutally by a police officer, by special forces policemen, uh, uh, and uh, you know, beaten to death on the Skopje Square, mm. and then it was very difficult to identify him because the kid would not uh, often sleep, uh, not sleep at home. So, so the family didn't think of reporting him for as missing for a few days. And we were playing Scotland, so there was a bunch of Scots uh, uh, rummaging around. So you see a, a dead body, but uh, nobody's claiming it, uh, and you imagine it's maybe a Scottish f football fan, or then there was this busker fest uh, of these street performers, so then you can also imagine could be one of them. The policeman was uh, Igor Spasov is the name, I think. He was trying to obscure his involvement. He went, uh, uh, he didn't say nothing to fellow policemen. Policemen saw him beating the child, but not, uh, you know, I guess assumed that he wasn't killed. Or, you know, maybe tried to cover up for the, for the man for a few days. So this caused a, a whole bunch of, uh, um, you know, speculations about the dead body. And SDSM seized on the, on the case uh, in 2011. This was the uh, early days of Twitter. So they became, uh, so Twitter was used to spread conspiracy theories that uh, the policeman who killed the boy was uh, uh, very close to Nikola Gruevsky, part of his uh, personal security details, so the entire government sprang into action to allegedly try to save him, etc. And um, there were some protests at the time, and then the whole thing exploded again in 2015 when Zaev published a tape, about a three-minute tape in which uh, Gordon and Kulovsky, the interior minister, is heard saying that the kid who was killed uh, looked like a drug addict. Uh, there were some uh, uh, Gruevskis discussing uh, how his chief of security uh, Urko uh, right. was his, uh, yeah, I remember uh, how he's lying about something, and this was made to look like uh, he's lying about the murder. Mm -hmm. So, this was the smoking gun which led directly to Grievsky. Uh This sparked a major protest by SDSM. That was the evening when uh, SDSM people tried to storm the government building. About 40 police officers were uh, injured in the protests. Uh, they were pushing like this burning dumpsters into the police, throwing rocks at them. It was a huge mess and it greatly contributed to the, to the colored revolution such as it was. And now this Albanian kid in Chicago, he publishes the entire tape, tw 12 minutes, not, wow. not just three. Okay. And you can clearly hear that uh, uh, the callous statements about the kid being a drug addict is in the context that, you know, Gordana is saying, uh, he looks like a drug addict. He had no chance of resisting the policeman. Hmm. He couldn't, you know, it's like beating up a child, literally. He was 20-something, the kid. Against him was a somewhat older, much bigger, bulkier, special police, special for police forces of, uh, you know, uh, member. Uh, the discussion that Urko was lying about something is, has nothing to do with this particular case. Hmm. It, it becomes, becomes clear for, from the full context. And furthermore, it's very clear that both Nicola and Gordana are actually exceptionally worried about the murder. Mm -hmm. They uh, are very clear-eyed that a police officer tried to conceal that he killed a boy with his bare hands on the city square, mm -hmm. and that uh, they're discussing at length that he should not be, the policeman should not be allowed any room to avoid a responsibility. Justice. And Yankulovska assures Grevsky that he will be detained the next day and that uh, the police will be cooperating with the investigation fully and they will pro uh, provide full available information. And the person was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Mm -hmm. And as soon as Zaev won uh, the elections, this was even the most bizarre part, he used this murder... Uh, 
so uh, cold-bloodedly, so in, in this type of propaganda campaigns, exactly the type of thing you would expect somebody like Tal Silberstein or Eric Burns to orchestrate for Zayev. Uh, and then Zayev goes to visit the, the Idrizova prison where Igor Spasov is serving, mm -hmm. and he shakes Spasov's hand in all smiles, both of them, in the picture. And then shortly after, Spasov received a reprieve from serving his sentence for a while at least. Uh, allegedly he was sick. I mean, he's obviously mentally not well, the policeman. Right. But he, he was released from prison under Zayev's uh, mandate. Oh. And now we have the actual evidence that uh, Gruevsky and Kulovsky, everybody in the government, were 100% committed to prosecuting this person, you know, providing all the evidence before the courts, so the courts can put him in prison, and th that it couldn't have been further from their minds to try to help him cover up the murder. And yet this was the narrative which SDSM spread about the Martin Nishkovsky murder, mm -hmm. the Nikola Mladenov car crash, the Kumanova attack, the Smilkovsko lake, the Good Friday massacre. This just shows, uh, you know, how ruthless and how propagandist the campaign, the colored revolution campaign was. A few of the colored revolution people have, again, you know, another one falls every week, they come out and say, I was fooled by this, I protested about this, I'm an idiot. Okay, thank you, but, uh, you know, the damage is done and uh, the place has gone to the docks, thanks well, to their yeah, idi idiots. Yeah, interesting, uh, you know, you said the, the tape that El Checa published was, what, 12 minutes and the original tape was three yeah. minutes. I think it just goes to show the this, how you can manipulate um, recordings, illegal recordings, I think it's worth mentioning again, that never should have been published in the first place. Uh, and then you blend that with conspiracy theories. And then, you know, it, the, the, then there's no truth anymore. It's just kind of whatever you want to believe, and et cetera. And that's what our friends on the uh, progressive left, the so-called colored revolutionaries, have, have chosen to uh, believe and abide by. And, and uh, now they are reaping what they have sowed. Um, mm. And this was the doing of American diplomats. Uh, uh, I mean, you cannot persuade me or anybody here that uh, you know people like Eric Burns were, came here without the knowledge or the approval of uh, the U.S. Embassy of Jess Bailey of David Stevenson. And we see this now happening in the U.S. as well. There is no more truth. Everything is a conspiracy theory. Everybody is an agent. Everybody is working for somebody. Uh, it's. Uh, I don't know what, what to say. It's, uh... Well, it, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that, because actually I started, I, I, I'm usually working on three or four different columns at the same time, and it just depends on which mm. one I want to, you know, finish first. But the issue of, of truth, especially truth in the media, uh, in, especially in the West today, uh, is, is one I just started working on the other day, and I'll be publishing that in the next week or two. And, and you know, there is truth. There has to be truth. Um, otherwise, everything, I mean, everything becomes whatever you believe truth to be. And then if there's no truth, you, you can't have... This is like our old friend G.K. Chesterton says, a moral standard has to remain the same, otherwise it's not a standard. And there has to be objective truth, otherwise you have chaos. And that is exactly what we see going on in our world today. And certain people take advantage of that chaos when you, when you reject the idea of objective truth. Anyway... Let's, uh, let's set that aside for now. Um, I got one more thing I want to talk about before we go to our farmer's mm -hmm. picks, Svetin. And of course, in our farmer's yep. picks, I always like to end with something positive, and it's usually on tourism. Um, this will be kind of, the, my farmer's pick will be something like that. Um, but the news item I want to start with, or end with, before the farmer's pick is on tourism. And it's fascinating because, uh -huh. uh, and I don't know, this is travelgazette.com. It says, quote, the number of tourists visiting Macedonia in May 2019 was 4.8% lower than in the same month a year earlier, according to the State Statistical Office of Macedonia. Mm. So really, this is the first time that we have seen a decline in tourists, both uh, domestic and foreign. In, and I don't know, I can't remember the last time there was a decline. I mean, it's mm. always been increasing. And May is a great time for folks to come to Macedonia. It's just before the high season, things are still inexpensive. I mean, they're always inexpensive in Macedonia, but it's it's beautiful. It's still springtime, uh, and yet the number of tourists has declined. And of course, you know, the question is why? Is that because of 
you know, the negative news coming out of Macedonia? Is that because people are afraid to go there because of Zoran Zai is, going, is arresting American citizens? Is it because uh, he, you know, the, the issue with um, uh, Wizair a couple of months ago, and, and uh, which has been bringing in so many foreign tourists to Macedonia? I don't know, but I think it bears mm. watching to see that after all these years, the number of tourists coming to Macedonia has actually declined for the first time in as long as I can remember. Yeah, and uh, the, as we mentioned, the all-important foreign espionage tourism segment <laughs> is uh, apparently doing well. So maybe that, that's maybe the collapse would have been even greater without those guys. Exactly. Well, <laughs> well let's take a short break before our farmer's picks. Um, and I just have to get here another glass of Mastica. And welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. Jason Miko and Svetan Chilomanov talking about all things Macedonia on a Sunday, July 14. This will drop on Monday, July 15. It's time for our farmers' picks. Svetan, what's your farmers' pick? Yeah, uh, well, we covered Zaev and his uh, brain farts, but uh, <laughs> uh, let, let's not leave Stevo Pendarovsky off the hook, you know, oh, the yes. allegedly... The, the president, I believe. Yeah, the polished, the worldly, the urban, uh, the non zaev uh, the anti zaev uh, SDSM politician, uh, uh, the pre who is now pretend, you know... Um, ah, he was elected, you know, duly elected, I'll call him president, so that's fine. Uh, you know. Yeah, of, of president of something, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he had uh, a few interesting, uh, you know, the, the more he's uh, in the public eye and meeting people, uh, the worse it uh, ends up for him. So he basically, um, he had the threat that uh, we'll start sending uh, migrants and our criminals from Macedonia to the European Union unless we're given, uh, you know, the right oh, to open right. EU accession talks. Um, and now he was uh, recently recorded, uh, uh, you have the big boys at some summit uh, uh, of Central European uh, countries uh, like uh, Borisov and uh, Brnabic, the Serbian Prime Minister, are discussing. And you can just see Stevo Pendarovsky trying to barge in onto the dis discussion. Mm -hmm. And he walks in and he, he's using this most Skopian thing ever. And he says, how are you doing, love? To Borisov, he says, "Kako si ljubavi?" This Skop Skopian word, like, which is so I don't know. And then he tried to uh, explain. Uh, he tried to save himself. He said, "No, I didn't say ljubavi. I said uh, hubavi. That's Bulgarian for beautiful. Uh -huh. Somehow it didn't help. It, it yeah. didn't fix yeah, things. So then, and then you have you have the Bulgarian guy and the Serbian girl uh, checking out some infrastructure projects, and Pendarovsky creeping around them trying to eavesdrop on what they're saying. <laughs> so it was really... He's not uh, showing himself uh, well in the, in the public light. It's not, this, is, this was not nothing major like threatening the European Union that well, uh, come later. will send mi migrants and criminals to them. Right. But he's, uh, he's not being uh, well received by the, it just sounds by the neighbors. Yeah, odd and creepy. We all we still remember when he tried to, uh, he, he, he went out, uh, when we were discussing this decoupling with Albania, because you know, this is the big deal, whether we try to open accession talks with Albania or separately, in which case, you know, in the latter case, we have better chances of opening accession talks sooner. Uh, and uh, now, obviously, Pendarovsky was elected with the Albanian votes. Right. Macedonians didn't vote for him, or at least the majority of Macedonians. And uh, Zayev also owes, owes his entire political career to the Albanian votes and the Albanian parties in, uh, and Idirama helping him out here especially. So Pendarovsky came out and said something like, we need to decouple from Albania, like, uh, you know, thanks for all the, for the good times, but uh, now we're, we'll, we'll take, take over from here. Uh, he was saying this to Rama, to the Albanians, and he was so... Uh, openly shut down by Rama, who literally reminded him, "Not don't forget who got you elected as president. And the very next day, Pendarovsky had to walk back his statement. So he is not, not doing well. So the, the images of uh, a hapless uh, 
Stepan Penderevsky trying to become a Balkan politician, a Balkan political leader will be my first pick for uh, for this week. Uh, Jason, what, what have you got for us? Well, uh, again, as I like to, uh, as I said earlier before uh, before the break, um, I like to end with something positive. Generally, it's on tourism. Uh, this week's farmers pick is a little bit about tourism and what goes on in Macedonia, and that is, of course, the 2019. Galicznik Wedding Festival, which uh, huh? ends today. It started, I think, on Friday the 12th and, and goes through today, Sunday the 14th, the day we're recording. Uh, it has been going on, I believe, for almost 50 years. It is uh, both uh, celebrated uh, you know, by uh, Macedonians domestically and, of course, attracts foreigners uh, as a major event in which uh, couples uh, are getting married in the small town of Galicznik, which is in uh, it sits in the, I believe, in uh, Mavro, uh, high in the mountains there, elevation yep. about 1,500 meters, almost 5,000 feet. Beautiful little town. Uh, the road uh, through Mavrovo National Park is just something to behold. It is austere. It is empty with these beautiful um, uh, golden hills and mountains uh, surrounding you as you drive yeah. into the town of Galicia. The horses. The ho yeah, exactly. I remember when we, when we filmed our uh, documentary film in 2009, A Name is a Name, uh, we went to Galicnik and we talked to the caretaker of uh, the church there, St. Peter's and Paul, which is the church where the weddings happen. Um, uh, and he had, he had a wonderful quote about how the Turks ruled here for 500 years and they didn't make us Macedonians. We, remain, we, we were never Turkish, we remained Macedonians, and we'll always remain Macedonians. Uh, but anyway, so my farmer's pick, and you can go on the interwebs and find all kinds of, all kinds of things about the Galicznik Wedding Festival, uh, but it is a wonderful part of, of Macedonia's history and Macedonia's uh, uh, culture and heritage in which uh, we celebrate, Macedonians celebrate weddings and a man and a woman getting married and then beginning their family. And I think that's, that's yeah. just a unique and wonderful part of Macedonia's culture and history. And I encourage folks, if they haven't seen it, to, to schedule a time, and well, it'll have to be next year now, to go to Macedonia <laughs> and witness the Galicznik Wedding Festival. That's my farmer's pick, Sven. Yeah, so somebody made a quip here that uh, uh, if you want to be completely inclusive in the way things are going, we, we will have to be. Uh, next year it might be a... Uh, an inter-ethnic Galichnik gay wedding. <laughs> <laughs> God forbid, no. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I think we've managed to get a full, um, full uh, podcast in, despite uh, having done one just a few days ago. Um, always great talking to you, Svetin. Yeah, we're making up for the lost time and uh, you know covering up all the all the things that uh, that uh, happened. I think we're uh, serving our, our audience base well. I hope so, yeah. I hope they enjoy <laughs> it. It's a, Again. it's a bit irreverent, but that's part of the fun. Talk. Well, uh, thank you everybody for tuning in, and until next time. Sounds good. Take care. Take care. Сепак очигледно Пендаровски не чувствува исто и за српската премиерка Ана Брнабиќ, на која само културно и се представи. Но Пендаровскиот Борисов очигледно не доби поврат на изјева на љубов и мораше само да дзирка во она што го гледаат српските и бугарските колеги. Љубави, да имаш неког, јас знаобим.